Did you know LinkedIn is using AI to write PCB design guidelines? They're terrible. Join me as we traverse the hellscape that is LinkedIn's AI-generated PCB design guidelines. Let's take a look. If you're on LinkedIn and you're not living under a digital rock, you probably have noticed that there are some AI-generated articles on LinkedIn. And some of them are about electronics design, electronics manufacturing, electronics engineering, PCB design, those kinds of topics. Well, we're gonna dive into some of the design guidelines that have been generated in these articles. They're definitely interesting. Let's hop right in to our first one. How can you minimize noise in your PCB design? At first glance, this looks like it has a lot of good information, things like choosing the right components, optimizing the layout, etc., etc. And we have some contributions from some folks who I have connected with, and I really do trust their input on these matters. Let's take a look at the first section of this AI-generated article. Choose the right components. Wow, I didn't know choosing components had anything to do with noise, but okay, here we go. First, you should select components that have low noise characteristics, such as resistors, capacitors, and inductors. You should also avoid using components that generate or amplify noise, such as oscillators, switches, or amplifiers. Okay, so we can't have clocks, we can't have switches, which means no HMI, and all those analog circuits that you make with op amps, those are out too. Oh yeah, we can't have RLC circuits either. I'm not really sure what's left. You should also consider the quality, tolerance, and rating of the components and use shielded or bypassed components when possible. Well, I've heard of shielded components, specifically like shielded inductors, which we have discussed on an earlier video. I've never heard of a bypassed component. What's a bypassed component? If anybody knows, put it in the comments. Let's take a look at the first response on this. Sina Desnabi writes, one of the most important sources of noise is a signal with a short rise time. Yes, exactly. It's not all about the component, it's also about the signal. Personally, I see this as a more important factor than the noise from high frequency signals in today's electronics. And then he goes on to discuss signals that switch on and off quickly, yada yada. We've talked about this many times on this channel. Let's take a look at the next response. Oh look, it's me. Before you start selecting components, make sure you learn about components from a source other than AI-generated articles on LinkedIn. If you were to follow the statements in this section, you would never be able to design a modern circuit. Some components generate more noise than others, and that is unavoidable, but by properly designing circuits and laying them out correctly in a PCB, that noise could be suppressed. The reason I started with this is to illustrate something really important about very short bits of AI-generated text, specifically on something technical like PCB design. They tend to overgeneralize things or really miss all of the context. And of course, as we know, if you've been watching this channel for a long time, that PCB design and electronics engineering is all about the context. Let's jump to the next section of this article. Section two. Optimize the layout. The second step to reduce noise in your PCB design is to optimize the layout of your board. You should follow some basic rules, such as minimizing the length and loop area of the traces, avoiding sharp bends and corners, and using 45 degree angles instead of 90 degree angles. <clears throat> really, 90 degree angles? Come on, LinkedIn. This has been so thoroughly debunked over and over. You should also separate the analog and digital sections of your board and use ground planes and vias to provide a low impedance return path for the signals. I hope it's not talking about planes as in analog plane and digital plane separated from each other because that's most of the time also the wrong thing to do. You should avoid routing noisy traces near sensitive traces and use differential pairs or twisted pairs when appropriate. Hey Altium, let me know when that new twisted pair routing tool comes out. I wanna get it for AD25. My advice is just do the exact opposite of all of this. Let's go to the next section. The third step to reduce noise in your PCB design is to use filters and decoupling capacitors to block or attenuate unwanted frequencies. Decoupling is kind of a form of filtering, but generally we're referring to the placement of a certain size of capacitor and not necessarily a specific circuit. I mean, it's just a capacitor that goes across power and ground pins on an integrated circuit. There are a couple of good responses to this. First, we have Nikolai Pavlov. To begin, I would not like light-minded use of the word noise. One has to be more specific. Is it DC-DC ripple on the power rail or in the ground conductor? Is it capacitive pickup of 50-60 hertz mains or RF envelope demodulation of one's own transmitter? Is it fundamental thermal or 1 over F noise? These are all great questions. 
The exact approach that you use for noise really depends on the type of noise or the source of the noise, and that's gonna dictate the filter circuit that you design to overcome it. Haldane Collins writes, I think distinction should be made that decoupling capacitance is intended to minimize reactivity of integrated circuits with the power distribution source impedances and reactances. Line filters are intended to band limit or truncate the total harmonic content as well as the signal distortion in a circuit. Also very true, and I think it's a good restatement of what Nikolai wrote, which is the exact method that you use to combat noise depends on the nature and source of that noise. Let's go to the next section. The fourth step to reduce noise in your PCB design is to implement shielding and grounding techniques to protect your board from external and internal noise sources. I feel like these articles are drawing from like 20 year old application notes from semiconductor manufacturers. Shielding is the process of enclosing your board or components in a metal case or foil, which acts as a barrier against electromagnetic interference. You should use shielding and grounding to isolate your board or components from noise sources, such as power lines, motors, or radios. Sometimes shielding is needed, but frankly, the ground plane in your PCB can provide a lot of shielding effectiveness. There are other techniques that are needed to shield besides just using big metal cans or a big metal chassis. So just to summarize, we already have some questionable or just outright wrong design guidelines. First, split analog and digital regions, probably with planes, wrong. Second, we have 90 degree traces are bad, also wrong, requires a big asterisk. And third, use shielding instead of proper grounding. I don't know about that. Let's go to the next article. What techniques can you use to simplify high frequency PCB designs? Number one, choose the right materials. The choice of PCB materials can have a significant impact on the quality of high frequency signals. Now this is correct and then they list some material properties here, but it's interesting if you actually decode what's being said in this guideline. Take a look at my response. This paragraph is a great way to say everything and nothing simultaneously. Quote, some examples of suitable materials are PTFE, polyimide, FR4, and Rogers. So literally any PCB material? You should consider factors such as, so think about all the material properties. Third point, quote, generally you want to use materials with low dielectrical constant and loss tangent. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop there and I'll let you read that response on your own, but I've brought this up multiple times. Just because you're designing a high frequency or RF board, it doesn't mean that you have to use low DK and low DF. There are reasons to use them. They often have to do with loss or sizing your traces appropriately to minimize copper loss, but you don't have to use it. A lot of boards will work just fine if they're on FR4. You're probably watching this over Wi-Fi right now. What material do you think was used to build that Wi-Fi router? Do you think it was Rogers 3003? Probably not. Most of the time, it's just plain old FR4. Section two, optimizing the layout. I can't tell you how many times I've seen AI tell you to optimize the layout when discussing PCB design. What does that even mean? This guideline then goes into points which are either incorrect or grossly out of context, like minimizing the length and width of traces to reduce parasitic capacitance and inductance, also keeping traces away from board edges and corners, also a bit grossly oversimplified, and then it mentions keeping differential pairs close together. That also requires a lot of context and we've discussed it in another video. Lastly, it says it's important to separate analog and digital signals and use ground planes to isolate them. No AI, no. Let's take a look at section three. Adding decoupling and filtering components. I'm seeing a pattern here. It's almost like all of the design guidelines on this article came from a different article. You know, the one that we saw at the beginning of the video. This guideline then goes into pretty much all of the same points that we saw in the previous article. I guess AI really can't be that creative, can it? <laughs> Let's take a look at one of the responses to this. Coco Wang writes, adding decoupling and filtering components, we have extra services such as finding alternative components during your design process. Contact me for more details at whatever their email address is. This person is literally using this space to advertise their PCB manufacturing services. Let's go to the next question. What is the best way to design a PCB for mixed signal applications? It actually starts with the exact same set of guidelines that it had on the other article about noise. Section two, layout strategy. Another important step in designing a PCB for mixed signal applications is to plan your layout strategy carefully. That's actually correct. You should separate the analog and digital sections of your PCB as much as possible and use different power and ground planes for each section. I thought you were gonna get it right this time. The rest of the stuff in here is basically correct as long as you use a single ground plane for everything in the design. 
Let's take a look at the responses. Larry Lowe writes, be sure to separate high and low voltage. Use a Faraday cage around the low voltage signals. This can be done with a grounded shield. You could also just move the ground plane closer to your signals. Anton Mamev writes, Data sheets, application notes, and other stuff from IC manufacturers often contain useful tips and layout examples. They can help you avoid some problems. No, all the big dogs in this field know that the semiconductor manufacturers do not always produce correct information for all PCBs. Be careful with application notes and take them with a grain of salt. Let's go to the third section, grounding technique. Interesting, because they just told us what not to do with the grounding technique in the previous section, but let's take a look. A grounding technique is essential for designing a PCB for mixed signal applications as it can reduce the noise and interference that can affect your signals. You should use a star or tree topology for your ground connection and connect the analog and digital grounds at a single point, preferably near the power supply. You just told us to not have connected ground planes. When you have digital signals, even with a relatively fast edge rate, you should just use ground planes. Don't rely on star or tree topology as you're gonna have an EMI nightmare. You should also use decoupling capacitors and ferrite beads to filter out high frequency noise from your power and ground lines. Once again, all the experts in the field will agree, you should not use ferrite beads to filter out high frequency noise on digital power lines unless you can prove you need them. Let's take a look at the next article. How can you create a PCB layout that is both functional and beautiful? I think this is gonna be a great topic and we have some great contributors here. First, optimize your routing and ground plane. If you read through this guideline, of course it mentions a lot of the same stuff that we saw in all of the other articles, such as avoiding sharp bends, loops, or stubs that can cause reflection, but it also says to use a hatched ground plane. Really, a hatched ground plane? I mean, in a flex board, sure, but definitely not in a rigid board. In a rigid board, just use a solid ground plane. The only reason you use hatching in a flex board is so that you can still bend the flex PCB if you need to. Let's jump to the next question. How can you optimize signal integrity when designing a PCB layout? There it is again, AI decided to use optimize. I guess it's just one way to say everything and nothing all at once. We also have some great contributors here, including Mike Krug from Altium. Hey Mike. Number one, choose the right materials. The materials you use for your PCB substrate, traces, and vias can influence signal integrity. You want to choose materials that have low dielectric constant. Once again, apparently AI thinks that the only way you can have good signal integrity is to have low dielectric constant and low dissipation factor. That is not correct. Regular old FR4 will work fine for a lot of applications. That's why it's used to build most of the PCBs on the planet. However, to the AI's credit, it does qualify that statement. For example, for high speed or high frequency signals, you may need to use materials that have lower dielectric constant and higher glass transition temperature. Thank you, you may need to use. As in, it's an engineering decision like many other things. Minimize trace length and loops. The longer and wider your traces are, the more parasitic capacitance and inductance they introduce to your signals. That's actually incorrect. In signal integrity, we tend to care about the parasitic inductance or capacitance per unit length. So the total length doesn't always matter. Sometimes it does, but not always. Increasing the width of the traces actually reduces self-inductance for a fixed distance to the substrate ground plane. It also can reduce the mutual capacitance between two conductors. It then mentions things about creating loops or branches in your traces as they can act as antennas that pick up EMI or radiate it. That is true. Good going, AI. Part three, once again, separate analog and digital signals. It is true you want to separate them, but how should we separate them? To prevent this, you should separate analog and digital signals on different layers or regions of your PCBs and use ground planes or guard traces to isolate them. Generally, you should use the same ground plane unless it's an isolated system or unless you need some other method to keep the return current for your analog signals separate from your digital signals. We have shown, others have shown multiple times that guard traces are not a magic bullet for preventing mixed signal crosstalk and preventing perception of noise in general. You should also route analog and digital signals at right angles to each other and avoid crossing them over each other. I had never heard of using orthogonal routing to try and prevent mixed signal crosstalk, but it's almost like there's a more effective solution. I don't know, separate them into different regions of the board or use complete ground planes to shield them from each other. Make sure you only use a single ground net, otherwise you'll have those ground planes oscillating with respect to each other and then they could create a lot of radiation. Let's take a look at the next section. Use proper termination and decoupling. 
Interesting that termination and decoupling are being brought up together, but let's take a look at what it says. If you read through this, it talks about adding resistors or other components at the end of traces to match impedance. And that is, of course, the definition of termination. Contributor Justin Massiot writes, Termination resistors are more often used at the end of transmission cables. We generally don't need to use termination resistors on a single PCB. Traces aren't long enough but we do use series resistors for impedance matching. Justin is mostly correct. I would just like to point out that for the interfaces where you might need to use termination resistors, it's already gonna be on die a lot of the times, especially when it's a standardized interface. Well, we've seen a lot of interesting design guidelines that have been generated by LinkedIn's AI. Some of them are somewhat correct, some of them require a big fat asterisk next to them in order to determine the correctness, and some of them are just plain disproven multiple times and, at this point, wrong. But what really takes the cake are the contributors, and I think the best contribution I've seen on one of LinkedIn's hardware engineering articles came from Dan Bynan. Let's take a look. Dan Bynan writes, Eat AI overlord. Stop contributing to these. They are stealing your thoughts for their models. So dumb. So very, very dumb. You are really dumb. For once, Dan, you and I are in total agreement. Thanks for watching this video, everybody, and be safe out there when you're reading LinkedIn's AI-generated PCB design guidelines. In an upcoming video, we just might try using some of these design guidelines to design a PCB, and we'll see how it turns out. Make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave a question or comment in the comments section, and last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.